Welcome to A Day of Prayer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Together, let's engage in relationship with Christ through prayer, faith, and His Word. Hello, I'm Layla, and you're listening to A Day of Prayer's Morning Bible Study. We're glad you could join us. Before we get into the word, Lord Charles, can you open us up in prayer? Yes. Lord, we just in, Lord, we just invite your Holy Spirit into our midst, Lord. I just ask that you continue to show your mercy to us, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you that in showing us your mercy, Lord, you have also shown us the right way to walk down, Lord. Lord, I also just thank you for blessing the people throughout our lives, Lord, and just blessing people even if we don't know them, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you for how have you been good to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, we're going to start a new study, discussion, in the Word. And we are going to begin in the book of Jude this morning. So, I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. It's a, a book that's, well mentioned but i don't know my experience not always really discussed so i'm excited to see what the holy spirit is going to reveal to us as we go through this mm -hmm. so could i get a volunteer to read the first four verses please i will jude a bondservant of jesus christ and brother of james to those who are called sanctified by god the father and preserved in jesus christ Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our com common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to, con to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in un unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men. Who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh. Amen indeed. All right, so in this first section, Jude gives his reason for writing this letter or epistle to the church. Um, so just to kind of set the the ground there. Um, so as we discuss this, of course, we're starting with y'all. And you can please share what the Holy Spirit is ministering to you and revealing to you. And ask any questions that you have. All right? Okay. All right. Well, and before you guys get started, honey, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of put a little bit of perspective to help sorted out for you as you're listening to the Lord. This is Jesus's brother. Yeah, we're going right? to cover that or, shortly, I would imagine. Yes, we will. But so as in his mother's son, but his natural father, Jesus's natural father would be God, right? His father that birthed him would be God. He was given by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other siblings that his mother gave birth to, Joseph was their dad, their, their natural dad. So, um, as he's writing this, he's not talking about, that's my brother. Uh -uh. He's reverencing my Lord and Savior. So that's a very potent place for him to be. And it clearly goes, okay, even being a relative of, in the natural of Jesus Christ, he still held him in the esteem of, let me cut that, cut that off, right, the natural perspective and look at him as my risen savior, mm -hmm. where, where he grew up as big brother. Okay, let's go ahead. Does anyone else get to go? No, go ahead, Connor. You can go, sir. Okay. The Lord bring to my attention verse 3 to verse 4. Okay. Where it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation... I found it necessary to write to you, ex exhorting you to con to content, content, sorry, 
to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for his condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That with that, the same things, oh, typically over time, actually, the Lord showed me that when you're inside of the Lord, don't allow them certain attributes or things that are ungodly to sneak into your life, mm -hmm. but keep a constant guard against them. Mm -hmm. And that also means not giving into people pressuring you or going, well, we're good. Yes, people pressuring you mm -hmm. and standing firm inside the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh -huh. Any more thoughts on that, honey? No. Okay. Hmm. Go ahead, Patrice. I found it very interesting where... Um, Jude was talking about how he had wanted to originally write to them about their common salvation, but he decided that the Lord was impressing on his heart to exhort them to do right. I just found that interesting because most times when we somebody's exhorting us, we immediately think we did something wrong, and now we have to be told what to do, but that's not the case. The Lord gives us preemptive warnings about what could happen, and he tells people to say, okay, go share this with them because they do not understand the full consequences of these things. So go share with them so that way they can avoid it altogether, not dabbling with them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also what was happening here in Jude and how instead of writing what he originally felt that he should write about, he was able and willing to listen to the Lord and to redirect his epistle. Mm. Amen. By, is that by listening to the Holy Spirit that he was able yes. to come to this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's an interesting point, sir. Very interesting point. What are you going to share, honey? I was just going to um, put us in remembrance of the scripture about Jesus doesn't, God doesn't allow us to be tempted above what we're beyond what we're able to endure, but not just barely endure, but not, he doesn't allow us to be tested beyond what we're able to conquer. So in order for that to be true, if we're not even allowed to be tempted beyond what we're able to conquer and subdue, then that means God has to keep his word and preemptively instruct us and equip us. Equip us. He has to give us everything we need to rule over Satan long before the issue arises. But it's a matter of, are we listening? Is our heart tender and is our ear open to God? And that's something, you know, I, I, I say things like that. And I mean, immediately, I think it's understandable what I'm saying. But if not, what does it mean to keep your heart tender and supple towards the Lord? It means that you make a commitment. Oh, you have an answer? Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. It, there's two possible means of that. It could be that you are willing to listen to what the Lord says and able to change your perspective on a matter instead of having it hard and saying, no, Lord, what I think is what I think, no matter what. But you're able to see it as the Lord sees it, and he can redirect your uh, sight of a matter and make it correct. The second is also that when something does come up and the Lord tells you to do something, you are able to go do it. Mm -hmm. You don't have preconceived notions about what you have to be doing in the circumstances. While it may not seem logical in that situation, what the Lord says is always better. Amen. That's it. Thank you, sweetheart. Oh. So it means you're you're willing to do whatever it is that God asks you to do. You've already taken the disposition and the attitude that God, you're right. And if there if there arises a case between who's right and wrong, you're right, and anything and everybody else is wrong. When it comes to head to head, if we have to measure and choose a side, I'm always going to pick your side, God, because you know. And if for some reason I'm out of alignment, I accept that heartily, wholeheartedly, that I'm, I'm missing it and you're right. So now, once you take that position that God is right, s subsequently, you take the position of 
then I'm going to get in alignment with what you said, God. And, you know, there may be times of, especially as a new, a new child of God, a new, um, a new believer, that you're maybe not quite sure. Am I hearing from God? Am I hearing that right? That's why we have the written word. Get, get yourself a good Bible that has all of its parts mm-hmm. present and begin to spend time in the word. And as you're spending time, keep your, make sure that you remind yourself to keep your focus aware of the fact that God wants to speak to you, that he loves you, and he wants you to understand his word and understand and know who he is and know him intimately, deeply. And um, so keeping your heart supple and soft towards God is actually very practical and easy to be done, but it won't happen without your determined effort. It's not going to just fall on you like ripe cherries off a tree as, you know, I've heard some um, some teachers say that Kenneth Hagin is one of those. It doesn't just fall on you like ripe cherries off a tree. It doesn't just happen. But when you purpose, God will meet you. Rest assured. Okay. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to say? Oh, I just wanted to add the scripture you were looking for was 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Okay. It says... No temptation, ha- no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to. With the able, but with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay. So, and we know how our heavenly Father likes to do things. He doesn't want to just barely scrape by. He likes to kick the devil's backside and <laughs> <laughs> make sure he knows. That he has been defeated. So our expectation should be such as that we realize when God is saying something to us, not to take a position of condemnation because that's not why he's here. The Holy Spirit didn't come to condemn the world, right? But to convict the world of sin, but also in that he came to, for the believer, he came to prepare us to take the things that belong to Jesus. And Jesus said, you'll take the things that belong to me because all things that the Father has belongs to Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is taking what belongs to Jesus by the Father and declaring it and making it known to us so that we're able to rule just like he desires for us to. So when he comes to you and he goes, look at this, or I'm, I'm telling you this information now, receive it. As from a father who loves you, receive it without any guilt or condemnation because those thoughts are not from the Lord and ask God, okay, now how do I apply this? I I see that you're telling me this. So first of all, I believe it's good for me and it's for my, my betterment and for my success. So now as I know this truth and stand on it, how do I apply it and then we go forward and we're watchful and we're on guard. And when we see that thing arise, just as the Lord told us, we apply the information or the weapon that he gave us that's appropriated for it. Mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead, sweetheart. Oh, and like you were saying, Mommy, I would like to just touch on verse four, like the first part of verse four. Oh. For certain men have crept in okay. unnoticed. That's Jude, right? Yes, in okay. Jude. Um, it goes to... The testimony I heard Mr. Dean give about the little foxes he had in his backyard. He thought they were so cute, but foxes grow up and they become big foxes. Mm -hmm. And their actions afterwards are not very cute. And Mm -hmm. how they eat the the low-hanging fruit, the things that you don't necessarily see when you look at a bush, you see the fruit that's higher up, not necessarily the low-hanging ones. But it's a reminder to us as believers to be guarded and watchful in every aspect of our lives, not letting any inch be given or taken by the enemy, but to stand guard on all of it and to actively contend for it, actively protect against these little things, even if it's like, oh, that's just really nice, or like even worldly sayings, not saying that I... Even worldly sayings, sure, might have a practical application, but you have to be careful that you're not taking their ideology and that you're not just taking the godly wisdom that was instilled in it because the world practices godly wisdom and manipulates it. 
but that you're not taking the aspect that God wants you to understand, but you're taking something extra and you're allowing it to be planted on the inside of you that corrupts and taints what the principle that God was trying to teach you. So clarify that for me. Say that again in a more direct way. Don't take everything that the world offers you, basically. Take what it is, the God principle, the godly principle and idea that God wants you to learn and to keep that, but leave the rest of it aside. Like when you seep a tea bag, you seep the tea to get the flavor out of it, but you don't want the bag to rupture and you don't want the herbs in the bottom because it's nasty. You're not supposed to eat it. (laughs) It's nasty. Okay. 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 I can understand that. Well, that's good. Um, It, it helps frame the context. So I think what Jude is trying to tell us here. So if we're to be on guard for the little foxes or whatever it may be, we have to know, what we're on guard against and so if we think about um back to genesis and when sin was introduced into the world um, my perspective is is that um um, and and this is this is dean's view (laughs) right i'm not i'm not saying thus saith the lord but um i i don't think adam did a good enough job in his role as the husband and protector of eve in that she didn't have a clear understanding of the word he hadn't handed that off well so when the enemy says, oh, God said you shouldn't eat of it, and she said, well, or touch it, well, that wasn't part of what God had said, although it was a good idea not to touch it. But, so she was already distorted in understanding God's word and only made it easier for the enemy to distort and then start appealing to her flesh. The um, amplified version of this talks about where he wants you to contend for the faith. Give me one second here to pull that up. And it, um, it expands on it. It says... Um, This is the, um, the faith that was handed down for all the, all the saints, the faith that is the sum of Christian belief that was given verbally to the believers. So we think about the time when this was written. Um, they didn't have a book of epistles all gathered together. They didn't have the whole Bible together. Mm-hmm. Even if they had the information, they may not have had access to it, mm-hmm. not as easy as we do. I'm... I'm doing this on a smart device and have access to it to look Mm -hmm. at it and all. Mm -hmm. So there's a saying I love, and that is the problem with communication is assuming that it actually happened. And so here Jews trying to say, I want to be clear. I wanted to talk to you about this. We need to talk about this. We need to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. We need to give you the tools you need to be on guard for those that have come in that have twisted God's grace to allow it to be used for sensuality and for pleasing the flesh, which is clearly not in the line with the beliefs that we've been trying verbally to communicate with you. So I'm going to write it down. Make sure it's clear for you what you're to be on guard for because you cannot let this happen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. It's a, great, it's a great word, Dean. And we're going to take that a little deeper because, yes, James, Jude is, is writing about so that we can understand, right? Um, And it's essentially contending for the faith. But it's interesting that why, I guess the additional reason why he is writing this. um, Verse 1, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, right? Um, It's interesting because there was a time where Jude himself was opposed to who Jesus was, being the Son of God. He was opposed to that. And you really see that spelled out in Mark 6. Actually, if we could get a volunteer to read the first six verses of Mark 6. I I want to point out a couple things in there. Is everybody there? Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he, had, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, 
Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Are they not his are not his sisters with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to him, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and his own in his own house. Now he could do no mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went out about the village in a circuit teaching. So I want to point out a couple of things. Dean, and you, you brought up another great point, too, about how today we have all this technology and, and all these, um, well, we have the New Testament, which they did not have then, all the, all the epistles in the New Testament laid out for us to, to study and to be able to glean more, more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of our Lord, of his, his plan, his purpose, his will for our life and in the, the bigger goal and picture of what he's actually doing. Um, but it's also interesting because the, they were Jewish, as in they were the Lord's chosen people, and were and are the Lord's chosen people, uh, Israel. And as a result, they had the scriptures. They had the word of the Lord. It was studied, right? It wasn't written out like we have it now where, hey, what, go to Isaiah 61, you know, verses 1 through 3, right? But they knew that's why you see Jesus reference, hey, doesn't it say in Isaiah, or it is written, and he just says what it says. Uh, it's not so much chapter and verse like we have today. But these are, these are individuals that knew the word growing up with it. So it was expected that everyone have some kind of knowledge or understanding of the words that the Lord has spoken through the prophets and, and over the generations. Um, but you see, in this section of Scripture we just read in Mark, it's interesting because Jesus is here teaching. And of course, everyone recognizes there's a difference in his teaching as opposed to what has normally been taught. And it also gives the, um, not the genealogy so much, but clearly states Jesus' family, right? His mother and his brothers. It, it lists them out very plainly. But here's the thing is the people took offense at him. They didn't receive what he said, what the, that is Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord and Savior. What he said and what he was teaching them, which is why in, verse, in Mark 6, verse 4, he says, Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. So uh, I bring this up because clearly at one point, James, his brother, who was the head of the church, and Judas, who's writing this epistle, or Jude, Judas, who's writing this epistle that we're reading, did not believe what he was saying. They found it to be foolish. They rejected what he was saying. And Jesus states that very plainly there. But now you have all this, however much time has passed, when Jude is writing this epistle, and as you pointed out, honey, and um, I'll say the intro, as we were, you were explaining this, this book and, or this epistle and what the purpose was for writing it and the place that Jude was now at, as in, yes, in the natural, I was Jesus' brother. But this is who Jesus actually is. And, you know, putting in the proper place and perspective, um, or, or I'll say putting Jesus in his proper place and having a right perspective or reverence of who he really and truly is and was and is. Um, I, I find it interesting because that's the first thing that Jude here is doing is acknowledging that, right? You're seeing the, the change and the transition as he has come into that. And, and I find that incredible because that's a, a, a process, if you will, that we all have to come to of regardless of where we started at. I mean, this is Jesus' own earthly, naturally, natural family, Right? And yes. they struggled with accepting what he was saying, which is only what the Father said, and doing only what the Father did, that they struggled. And eventually, they, 
the contended, right? I find it interesting that he he says that in verse 3. I write to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Like, he's saying, wrestle, get that under control. Like, come to this place where you recognize who Jesus is because it matters. And then he, pr- he proceeds in verse 4 to also say that there are people, and we've been discussing this, uh, especially, I mean, throughout Scripture, but, you know, really at the end of Second Peter, um, how there are people who have come into the church and may even be in leadership or whatever their place is that ultimately will, can steal it from you. Now, again, I bring it up, right? These are, this is Jesus' own family. They are the children of Israel. They grew up with the word, learning it, being taught it, and taught its, its meaning, if you will, in the synagogues and in all those things. And just like the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, right? This is Jesus' own earthly natural brother, and he missed it, if you will, at the time. He wrestled, argued, resisted, rebelled, rejected, whatever adjective you want to throw in there of who Jesus really is. He didn't recognize it at the time, but eventually came to a place where he realized the truth and latched onto that with everything he had and is now exhorting others to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. When you look at Mark, was it Mark chapter 6? We Mark 6, yes. Mark 6, and... You're looking at how the people were talking about him, like who who do you think you are? Basically, it it was holding Jesus in a place of being common, mm-hmm. and and in that I can see myself before I I truly came to Christ, holding him in a place as being common, not reverencing his blood and his body, not reverencing his deity, his godness, and treating him like he was just any old somebody that didn't have a right to uh, command me, who didn't have a right to determine my coming or going or to speak concerning me or into my life. He didn't have a, a, an op- a right to say yay or nay to me because I didn't honor him or respect him as anyone superior, as living God, as my Lord and Savior. I treated him as common. And then as Judas coming into this place, now how he is reverencing Jesus and elevating him. And although he is truly in spirit, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and he's coming to all that revelation, you know, that this word is being exchanged between the apostles and they're learning from the Holy Spirit. And as I mean, like Paul is writing, Peter's writing, Judas writing, they're sharing the word of God with each other. But coming to a place of going, you are my God, and now reverencing him and looking at him in a place of being holy. And, you know, the same journey is, as, that's what I went through as a, a person coming to Christ from treating him as common and mishandling his sacrifice, his body and his blood and his rights to me as my creator, then to now going, well, if, if anybody has a right to speak on me, Lord, it's you. Amen. Because I'm enjoying your breath. I'm enjoying your grace. I'm enjoying your life on the inside of me. So if anybody has a right to tell me, say, come come here or go there. If anybody has a right to tell me what pleases or displeases them or um, what my outcome would be, it's you, Jesus. Because you are the end all be all. You are the all in all. In you, the fullness of the Godhead dwells. So... I, I really, I love that. And it, it just ministers to me because it means the apostles are no different than the path that I had to take. Exactly. Even being a natural half brother or brother of Jesus Christ, even being one who touched him, smelled his breath, which I would have loved, <laughs> breathe on me, Jesus, or played with his hair or, you know, saw him in the morning when he woke up and laid down with him he still had to come the same you know the same route that i did things that i would place value on in the natural 
he got to do those. And yet, and still, he had to come the same pathway that I did, meaning that our God is exactly who he said he is. He's no respecter of persons. And even his mother had to come through the way of salvation. She naturally gave birth to Jesus. She felt him stirring in her womb and she pushed him out and held him and nursed him. And she yet and still had to bow down and, and reverence and recognize him as Messiah. Exactly. Most high God and risen savior on top of that. Her baby was her Lord and her King. That's a, just an amazing thing to me. And, Which, you know, I just appreciate the goodness of God. Amen. And should add more clarity when Jesus says, who are my mother and brothers, right? Cause there was a point where in scripture it says that they were outside waiting. They couldn't even get in the house and, Jesus was informed, your mother and your brothers are outside. He said, who are my mother and brothers? But those that do the will of the Lord. Amen. And notice he didn't give away the place of father. Because mm-hmm. he has but one. That's it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I really love how this, this starts because there's so much, you know, I'll say revelation in it, but also you can see the the place where Jude is at now and has clearly fought or contended to come to, you know, his, his own misconceptions or preconceived notions that he learned off of, you know, just, I'll say religious ideology or thinking or traditions or, and, and he's, he's or just saying humanity, it, just being exactly, a human. <laughs> but he's saying it, it's wrong. And, you know, and then he outlines and in, in for why it's wrong. Right, and, and that, hey, there are people that are looking to steal away. What, he's, what he says is our common salvation, uh, which is it's common, is available to all. But the, the issue or the question is, will you take it? Will you receive it and latch on to it mm-hmm. and do those, those things necessary? And by that, I mean... So will you serve the Lord fully with all your mind, heart, body, soul, and strength? Will you do that? And then will you love your neighbor as yourself? That, that's what the Lord is asking. Mm-hmm. Will you do that? Because it is, it is common as in it's available to all. But will you take it? Will you receive it? And will you move forward in it? Mm-hmm. And that, unfortunately, is is the hang-up point for many. And so we were using two different definitions for common. The common that I referenced was treating Jesus as lowly, mm-hmm. as something that is not special or someone who is not special and is easily replaceable. And the common that you are referencing, darling, is the one that is shared amongst all of us. It's exactly for all of us to use. We have this in common. We share this trait. We share our love for Jesus Christ. And the salvation that he gave is not just for one, but it's for everyone who will come and be a part of it. Okay? So one is disrespect, oh. and the other is made available for all. So, Which, a separate note, it should add some, some clarity to the first church when it says, and they had all things in common. Mm-hmm. Does, that, does that make more sense now, hopefully? Mm-hmm. Oh, now, now right. I understand. Okay. They, they were sharing their goods. Great segue. There's one other thing that's common here, too. It's common that we're all susceptible to what the enemy will try to bring at us. Absolutely. So this clearly says this is the called. Yes. Right? He's clearly identified this. This isn't a seeker. This is somebody who has been predestined, called upon to be Christ's follower, Mm -hmm. and yet he's being warned against them because there are men who are capable of, of twisting the grace that God has to lead us away to the things of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And we all have to be on guard of that. We cannot think highly of ourselves in our walk, as it were, a Mm -hmm. Christian term. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, where we are as a Christian, that we should ever feel like we're safe from the attacks of the enemy. Actually, we should probably think opposite of that, and that as we become more mature, we're open to even more. As it were, we're more of a threat to the enemy as we grow So we should expect to see more evidence of him trying to trip us up. And hopefully as we've matured, there are not so many things or hooks that the enemy has that he can come and claim anything in us. Yeah, yeah, these Mm -hmm. things, ideally, um, the impact of them becomes less. Like like we say, you know, know, Christianese, right? As we speak (laughs) in terms that mostly Christians would know, right? Mm -hmm. 
we're, we're, we are never sinless, but we sin less as we grow in Christ. So ideally, we're able to see the enemy's schemes, his working, his fallacies, his draw to our flesh much easier and from a farther distance mm-hmm. as we grow and mature in Christ. Absolutely. But the... The um, the fact that the enemy would still do them is never going to go away. In fact, like you know, there are times where there is it's an onslaught mm-hmm. where he will, okay, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've certainly have experienced times where it's like literally hours of a barrage of just one thing after another yes. where he's trying to conquer my mind to get me to think of a place other than that God is sovereign and then I can rest in His sovereignty. Amen. Absolutely. 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 And not until he's thrown into the lake of fire <laughs> will we be done with him forever. And, you know, as you're saying, Dean, we are designed and created in the image and the likeness of God to rule over sin and rule over the enemy and subdue him and keep him in his place, which is under our feet until said time. But not getting slackful and thinking, oh, I can put down, you know, I can take up my ease now because I'm mature. I don't have to be on guard. I don't have to have my um, armor of God on. I don't have to be listening and awake and alert in prayer. I don't have to be watching over myself so that, you know, making sure that no seeds have blown in, been carried in on the wind, if you will, or no enemy has thrown anything over my over my fence to find um, its place to take root in the ground and the soil of my heart or my lifetime. So absolutely, absolutely. And I, I really enjoy how Jude is talking very similar to what Peter was talking about. Absolutely. And they're both talking about wicked people drawing away the children of God away from the truth that is only found in Jesus Christ and dispersing them into something else, which is ungodliness. And Peter articulated it with more words, but, um, you know, ungodly men who turn the grace of, of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I think that's that sums up pretty well the words that Peter expressed to say the same things, that we have an adversary who, as a roaring lion, is going about seeking whom he may devour. It's our job to be on watch and on guard, and the older ones we should be teaching and helping and instructing the younger ones on how this is how you put your armor on, this is how you wield that sword, as the younger one also takes forth the effort to prepare themselves, but at the same time, the older one is still watching. They're still using the wisdom that God has given them, listening to the Holy Spirit daily to not only subdue the enemy before he has a chance to even raise his head up, but if for some reason he does... We're ready to deal with it and cut it off without it ever having to yield any fruit in our lives. And, you know, like you were saying, Dean, you keep in your mind. Now you're aware before you would have been like, man, my mind is just all over the place and maybe have thought it was just your own thoughts. But at this point, you're mature. So you're like, I understand who that is. I recognize it right away. Put it in its place. Get it under my feet. I bind that. I bring it into the captivity of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you cast it out and then you fill in, you re remind yourself or you put on the mind of Christ and go, oh no 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 I have the mind of Christ this is what God has already said is truth and it's my job I believe what God said and I rest in him so amen yeah as uh, Layla was saying and we were in Peter about um, the reference of the the spirit being cast out and coming back with seven more mm-hmm. right oh. so it's upon us now as we cast those things out that we fill those back up fill that space up with the increasing knowledge and maturity in Christ so that's that we right. don't invite others to come back and fill that in. Amen. And we don't just put anything in there, right? We don't just put a good idea in. We put in the truth of the word of God. When we cast the enemy out, we don't just go, oh, we're going to find a new, another lie that just sounds better, <laughs> right? We're not putting, right? Another bad idea that just looks prettier, but it still has nothing to do with God. You go, how, how is that possible? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. But we, we cover and fill in with the truth of God's word, place and presence of the Holy Spirit and our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ himself and alone and our hope being placed firmly in him. So, amen, Dean. Amen. That brings us right back to verse one, right? To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Christ. 
Right? There, mm-hmm. there is an order there and, and a process, if you will, built in. Mm-hmm. Um, but in Romans 1, right, Paul talks about his, his position as a bondservant of Christ. and That's Romans 1.1. 1, 1, and says he's called to be an apostle, but then he says, separated to the gospel of God. Right? That's talking about himself personally. But I find it interesting because just like Jude here, also is essentially stating, yes, uh, consent earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to all the saints, right? Um, he's essentially getting at the same thing, right? That we're all called, right? In the same letter to Romans, Romans 1, verse 7, Paul also says, to all who were in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. And this is very similar language, if you will, to what's found in, in Matthew, right? When we talk about calling, right? Um, it says, for many are called, but few are chosen. But then Jesus is also talking about the end of days or end times, right? Where, and this is in Matthew 24, that, that verse was Matthew 20, uh, sorry, hmm. twenty two fourteen, And then in Matthew 24, 22, he talks about, if the days had not been cut short, nobody would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And he gives the reason why in Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders that would deceive even the elect. Here's the key. If that were possible. So there's a, a very distinguishing thing that Jude here is covering in this, uh, the second part of verse one, right? To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, right? Doesn't Jesus say that you are clean because I washed you with the water of the mm-hmm. word? And, and Paul references that in, I want to say Galatians. Um, might be Galatians or Ephesians. Um, don't, so I'll have to look that up and get back to you on that. But uh, Paul also references the same thing. So sanctified by God the Father, and then the key there, also key, preserved in Jesus Christ. Amen. Who said, I go to prepare a place for you, receive the Holy Spirit. Right? And as we have we pointed out in, in Peter, it is the Holy Spirit that gives you discernment, mm-hmm. that lead, that is there to lead you and guide you. Those that, those that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God, mm-hmm. right? Talking, bringing it back to Jude with sonship and relationship, and he recognized things now in his life, or is in a different place now in his life, looking at his relationship with Jesus, who, yes, on earth was his brother, but now he's acknowledging he is Christ, he is the Messiah, he is God. And mm-hmm. he's the one that preserves us mm-hmm. through, yes, his atoning work, uh, being the propitiation for our sins and shedding his blood on the cross, but then also or sending the Holy Spirit to help lead us and guide us and help preserve us, all those who would put their hope and their faith and their trust in him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just lastly, before we tie this up um i made a statement about that they were sharing the word with each other Mm -hmm. um and you know the holy spirit's ministering to them notice how everybody is starting to open i'll say everybody i'll use that um loosely every jude is going jude a bond servant of jesus christ Mm -hmm. we hear that out of peter we hear that opening and that greeting from paul so that's that's amazing and interesting for us to understand that even still they had to fellowship together, right? Even still they had to be listen, listening to the Holy Spirit and guided by him. So those are important things that we should look for and adhere to also. Amen. All right, well, there's, there's a lot in there for, mm-hmm. to, to contemplate. And by contemplating, I mean bring before the Lord and let the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit minister to you. So... Um, yeah, let's close out for today. Can I get a volunteer to close out in prayer, please? I will. All right, Layla. Lord, I just thank you for today and for your goodness and for the blessings you've been pouring out on us, Lord. And I ask that you continue to teach us, Lord, about you and your ways and just guide us through our days and 
through the activities that we're doing, Lord, and just keep us straight, Lord, and strengthen us, God, in our, our minds and our assurance in you, Lord, and knowing that we can fall back on you and we can find everything that it is that we need in you, Lord. And I thank you for our listeners and for those who are coming to you, Lord, the new believers into the family, Lord. And I ask that you will strengthen them as well, Lord, and encourage them and keep them straight and guide them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to A Day of Prayer. We trust the Lord that you are strengthened and encouraged in your relationship with Christ. Visit us on our website, adayofprayer.org, where you can check out our blog, find additional study resources, or shop the official A Day of Prayer store. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So until next time, take care and God bless you.